everyone, and welcome. I'm Margaret Stewart, I'm the User Experience Manager at YouTube. Uh, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Ellen and Julia Lupton to, to Google today. Uh, Ellen and Julia are educators, citizens, mothers, and identical twins who write together and separately about matters concerning design and everyday life. Ellen Lupton is the curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in New York City and the director of the Graphic Design and the Program at Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. She also recently was a part of the jury for the Doodle for Google competition. Um, Ellen uh, is a frequent lecturer around the world and will speak to about design to anyone who will listen. She wrote that, I didn't, so I guess you guys are a part of the crowd. Um, Julian Lupton teaches English and writes books about Shakespeare at the University of California, Irvine. And Ellen and Julie are co-authors of the design blog, designyourlife.org. Julie contributed several essays to Ellen's book, DIY, Design It Yourself, and then went on to co-author the sequel, DIY Kids, released in the fall 2007. They're here to speak today about their latest book, Design Your Life, The Pleasures and Perils of Everyday Things. Please welcome Ellen and Julia Lupton. one kind of egg and just one at a time. And this is not 
really, in my point of view, a desirable product in the incident. And then, of course, you could think of all the different types of dishes that you could make with an enhanced extra functional toaster. This is great for single guys on Saturday night. Um, but then there's the kind of Uber toaster, right? The toaster oven, which is really great because it does all these other things like defrost pizza and, and so forth. Doesn't really make great toast. I, I currently have a, a minivan like this and I'm all frustrated with its toasting capabilities, but I really like the way I can burn cookies in it. Um, so at the end of the day, we look at, at products as having this continuum from doing one thing really well to doing lots of things not so well, or the kind of over-specialization of, of Mrs. James Bond there, which is really, I think, not where you want products to be. So I'm going to talk about some slightly larger appliances that also involve the kitchen. Now, this is the first computer designed specifically for kitchen use uh, by Honeywell. Uh, has a very small screen, keyboard, a nice workstation right above the equipment, which uh, was clearly designed by a man. Uh, it has a very large footprint. It also had a very high price point at $10,000. It was the cost of a modest tracks house in 1969. And so this computer, although it projected a certain space age fantasy, is really part of the prehistory kitchen competing. Uh, the media fridge is a kind of fantasy of marketers. The refrigerator is the largest appliance in the kitchen. It's an energy hog. It runs all day and all night. And all it does is keep your food cold. So wouldn't it be nice if it also delivered the declining stock market and allows you to know when your milk is out of date and gave you up updates on the status of your Viagra subscription. Uh, and so these do exist, but they haven't really successfully caught on with consumers. Uh, this was uh, another uh, computer in the kitchen experiment uh, from the early part of this uh, uh, century. Uh, these were designed by younger men, most likely, with the goal of getting their mothers online. The idea is that women and people over 45 couldn't learn how to use a personal computer. And so these internet appliances, which cost the same as regular computers, but had the added advantage of having porn star names, uh, it gave the consumer internet access only. Uh, these also did not catch on in most kitchens. Now the reality is something more like this. Um, this is our house. <laughs> My children are recognizing it. I have the refrigerator here, which uh, is completely devoid of smarts, but does the jobs inside. And then my kitchen computing uh, outfit here. I have two screens. Uh, that's because my hero is Al Gore. Uh, when Al pictures of Al Gore's office were published in Time Magazine after he won the Nobel Prize, um, life hackers were shocked by how much paper this world saver was accumulating. Wasn't he killing a lot of trees in the process of working on environmental issues? Well, one of the themes in our book, we have a chapter called Piles, Everyone Gets Them, <laughs> is that, in fact, creative people often have stacks of papers and books in their workspaces, and that those stacks are actually visualizations, not only of their to-do lists, but also of their active knowledge. And so that a healthy number of stacks, stacks that don't become fossilized, are actually signs of productivity and growth. And we also have the multiple screens, which increase productivity as well. There's also the issue when you have a home computer, a kitchen computer, of visibility. Now, office uh, theorists talk about the prairie dog as a particular type of office worker who inhabits a warren of cubicles and is known to intermittently pop up and look over the walls of the cubicles to see what else is going on in the office suite. 
But actually, this prairie dog activity keeps offices running smoothly and can be replicated in the home office as well. These are my prairie puppies, my children, who are two of the four. And I can just pop up at any point and make sure that they're still playing Scrabble and haven't turned on the television. <laughs> now, as long as they are, know that they can see and be seen, they leave me alone. As soon as I retreat to a private workspace, the mommy chorus begins. <laughs> Another chapter of our book is called, I'm not sorry kids, but it's called How to Spend Less Time with Your Kids. <laughs> and one of our theories is that actually increasing visibility can decrease contact. <laughs> now, the new urbanism is a uh, attempt to make post-war suburbs look more like pre-war cities uh, to improve sidewalk space, public space, walkability, and sustainability. And many of the principles of the new urbanism have also been applied to 21st century office design, and these theories are fully in effect here at the beautiful Google headquarters. Uh, here's uh, some, some charts from the Herman Miller Company who have really pioneered some of these new office plans. This is a traditional office layout with the warren of cubicles, suitable for prairie dogs, and then much office space spent for private offices for higher level managers. Now what Herman Miller suggests is that you rezone that space and you have much smaller cubicles, less private space, and a great deal more open space for meetings where the informal and often unscheduled exchange of ideas can occur. Uh, conference rooms are hard to schedule, but open pods like this actually encourage the exchange of ideas as well as bodily fluids. <laughs> now, the reality, if you don't work at Google, and you still are employed in America, it's probably more like this. You work in an office, you have a tormentor, and you have no place to go. Even in a normal office space, there are ways to zone that space to improve productivity and good humor. Now at the University of California, in the office that I run, we have some terribly ugly furniture. But we try to zone the space to encourage exchange between faculty, graduate students, now, some people may work neither at home nor in an office. And sociologists talk about these as third places. They also call them Starbucks. And in a third place environment, uh, workers can create their own cubicle using earphones and laptops and a hunched, sullen posture of complete absorption. We will write about anything. Um, we we'll talk a little bit about how objects that we use affect our behavior. Have you ever gone into your bathroom at home and sat down on the toilet and discovered that the last person there failed to put a fresh roll on the thing, right? Are these people stupid? Right? Or is this a design problem? Okay, now think about this. It. It's really hard work to change the toilet paper roll. We've studied it. It takes two hands and at least six separate motions to actually remove that little cardboard tube with the one little piece of paper hanging from it and replace it with a nice fresh roll. Now, that is really hard work, right? I mean, you wouldn't bother either, right? <laughs> It's hard work, right, Ellie? Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, your, your typical, you know, nine out of ten toilet paper dispensers in, in private use look like that. They're spring-loaded, and they contribute to this great difficulty that people have with the basic uh, human manners of putting a fresh roll when you're done. Um, now this type, which is what I favor, I call it the open-ended design, a 
allows him to do the entire operation with one hand and just about two arm motions. It actually makes people behave better. Okay, so a simple change in design can actually change the level of civilization in your bathroom. Now you might ask, why is it that nine out of 10 designs look like that and not like this? What is it that makes people so afraid to have a design that functions better? At the end of the day, it's about security. Isn't everything really about security? Right, so people feel much safer knowing that their toilet paper roll is not going to fly across the room <laughs> unexpectedly. And so they, they come up with the bad manners and the restraint and behavior that comes from the inferior design. And then there's this, we see this a lot, especially on the college campuses. <laughs> uh, it has a lock and key. And the reason for this is that college students are actually known to steal toilet paper. And here's how it works. They, they come to college and they, and they discover that toilet paper does not automatically replenish. It's not like electricity or breast milk or some other kind of natural resource that comes out of the home. Uh, indefinitely, but you actually have to go to the store and buy it, and so then they, they just take it when they need it for their own apartment. And so, hence the um, lock and key design was invented. This is an experimental design created by the architect Shigeru Ban, Japanese architect who's known for creating actually entire buildings out of toilet paper rolls and other old cardboard tubes. And he was asked to invent a new kind of toilet paper roll and what he did is he created a square core instead of a round core. And by doing that, when you go to pull the toilet paper down, the thing bumps awkwardly against the wall instead of smoothly rolling, and therefore it inhibits waste. <coughs> people will lose, use less. So you know, like some people, they'll like wrap their entire forearm. <laughs> hard work, right? So again, behavior. How can a simple design affect how people behave? I am one of the last people. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, this Excellent. is a comment. Uh, yeah. Another danger of the traditional design is uh, the spring-loaded rod. As a way of springing places, you definitely don't want it to go. Well, the danger to the, to the human body. Is that what you mean? Or into the toilet. Yeah, or elsewhere. Okay. Places you don't want to retrieve it from. Soggy toilet paper rolls. Well, there are serious dangers in the bathroom, for sure. Um, I'm one of the last people in the Western world to actually carry my luggage. It's sort of a macho thing. I mean, the word is luggage. You're supposed to lug it. Okay, well, I go to airports and train stations and even the streets of New York, and everybody is wheeling their stuff behind them. I find it very annoying, and I will go to my grave, perhaps hunched and bent, and turned into a, a sort of bent crone, but I will be carrying my stuff. Why does it annoy me? Well, it annoys me because it changes people's behavior in a way that I find irritating. Um, it is a good design. Um, obviously, putting things on wheels means that we can carry a lot more stuff. We can pack you know, three seasons worth of clothing for a weekend outing somewhere. Um, mothers are told to buy you know, backpacks for our kids that have wheels on them to prevent damage to their delicate spines. Now here I think the real problem is homework. Like the kids have too much homework. If they didn't have so much homework, they wouldn't have to drive their backpack off the bus. I'm sure you all agree too. I mean, pretty soon I think kids won't have to carry any. Right? Their lunch boxes, their iPods, their cell phones, they can all be on wheels. They can all just travel very obediently behind them. Um, but so here we have this design, um, and, and we, we, we can see that the two designs take up different amounts of space, right? You can obviously carry a lot more stuff and occupy more space if your stuff is on, on wheels. But yeah, that's okay, it's a free country, carry what you can. Here's what bugs me. The guy carrying his own stuff, he's mentally aware of how much room he takes up. Whereas the other guy, 
He doesn't know. And in fact, that's the whole point of the design. Okay, the, the wheels on luggage are designed to allow you, the user, to forget how much stuff and how much space you take up. Therefore, the rest of us walking behind you, we have to be aware, right? Because we're going to trip over you when the guy stops. Um, so this is an example of what I call like a good design, right? Brilliant, put wheels on everything, but bad behavior. And so maybe people can incorporate a little self-consciousness as they walk. Um, they won't get on my nerves so much. Um, there's lots of other alternatives, ways that I think I could dominate the airport with my own equipment. There's been lots of ways to develop to carry stuff great distances. This is one of my, my invention concepts. Why not just motorize the whole thing? You can just drive on top of your luggage, just go right through airport security with your own motorized kind of luggage cart. I thought this was a really cool idea, and then, then someone sent me an email and said that, that this actually exists. This is a motorized beer cooler, so that you can drive your beer through the uh, stadium parking lot. And of course, your dog. I thought dogs actually like walking. <laughs> so the, our next uh, epidemic will be doggy obesity. <laughs> Get ridden around in little cars like this. We also try to ask some really big questions in our book. Uh, my children asked me once, uh, Mommy, why are all the baby carrots the same size? We're not all the same size. So I thought I'd do some research on that. And it turns out that what are marketed as baby carrots are actually milled from large, misshapen, uh, often middle-aged carrots. And these carrots, which are not straight enough for the cellophane bags, are thrown into a special machine which shoots out these shiny, uniform pellets. And so what appears to be baby is in fact not baby. And but probably the only way in which I'm a foodie, I never call myself a foodie, but the one foodie thing that I do is I peel my own carrots. And it's really made a big difference in terms of their knowledge of what a carrot is in my house. Well, my research on baby carrots made me think about baby lettuce. Maybe baby lettuce wasn't baby either. Well, baby lettuce is baby. But it has other problems. First of all, when you open the bag, have you noticed that sometimes there's a kind of dank, swamp-like smell? And you actually have to rewash it because it's already started to rot in the bag. Well, that's because the baby, each baby lettuce has to be severed. And so it has a kind of broken, bruised bottom. And that creates a kind of decay effect. Uh, when we had the E. coli problems in California a couple of years ago, Part of the problem was traced to the fact that large vats of baby spinach that had been gathered from fields, different kinds of fields, different fields in California, were all being washed and mixed together in great promiscuous vats. And so a few heads of E. coli could transmit the bacteria to much vaster populations of baby spinach. Now there's also the problem of those hard, bitter, tough lettuces that they insist on putting in the bags of lettuce. In my household, we call them pubes <laughs> uh, to indicate their, curl their short and curly category. Now, no one likes pubes. Even they <laughs> don't like pubes, OK? So why do they put them in there? Well, they put them in there. These are the packing peanuts of the baby lettuce. You see, if you put enough of those short and curlies in there, it creates a bit of air and helps slow down that natural rot that is occurring from the brood stems. Now this is a brilliant package design. Whoever came up with it deserves a Nobel Prize. It has outer uh, layers that protect the interior of the lettuce, uh, protects the unnecessary transmission of bacteria, it's self-cooling. It requires no additional pubes to be added to the mix. And so my other foodie, my other only other foodie thing is to actually take full heads of lettuce and transform them leaf by leaf into salad. 
While we're on the question of plants, I want to ask you this question. Why is one of these images sexy and the other one not? After all, all flowers should be sexy. What are they but the genitals of plants? So when you give somebody a bouquet for Valentine's Day or as a morning after gift, you're basically giving them a handful of genitals, of sex organs. <laughs> So in our books we have 
have a whole section on how to make your bed and the kind of choices that people make and what that expresses about you. We call this the dread spread, and that's sort of the, the, the classic, like the matronly bosom tucked under a nice square and flat, um, very, very traditional, as opposed to the more romantic uh, wedding cake. And that is a term that decorators use. Um, it's for a pillow arrangement that goes from uh, the largest ones at the bottom, the tiny ones at the top, and it's very uh, romantic as long as there's still room for the people in the bed when you're done. Um, McMansions have their own furniture. Um, these huge houses in the suburbs, you can't just put regular furniture in there because it looks too small. So they actually make these beds that are very enormous and require separate bedding, and you actually have to go up a little flight of stairs just to get into the bed. <laughs> you go to a place like IKEA, you can't even buy king-size beds there because IKEA is a global company, and only in America do people have beds and they're really that big. And then how anybody here does not make your bed at all? <laughs> oh, these guys, come on, own up to me. Uh, I've got some honest people. So I have a name for you too. We call you the existentialist, right? Because isn't it a lie, right? People that they get up in the morning and they smooth out the covers and they pull up the sheets all tight and they make it look like, oh, like they didn't wash the linens, right? Their bed is just as dirty as yours and it's making it look neat, right? Still got the dead skin cells and the farts and stuff from the night before, right? So be honest. Um, the poet, that's in reference to W.H. Auden, this is one of the great poets of the 20th century. He was, he was known not just for his poetry, but for his sublimely messy apartment. Um, and he would just keep his bed covered with books and papers. Why not? For many of us, that's the biggest flat surface in our entire lives. I was at a, at a luncheon some years ago for a, for a colleague who had just come back from a trip to China, and she had adopted a beautiful baby girl, and she was going to raise this child herself as a single mother in New York City on a curator's salary. A very brave, courageous act. She was happy, she was excited, and she was exhausted. And one of the other women at the lunch said, you know, what you need is a husband. And this was like really not the right thing to say, and there was a big silence. And she, she quickly recovered the married lady. She said, no, what I mean is one of those corduroy pillows with the little arms on it, it's called a husband, and you sit in bed and you can have a beer and smoke a cigarette while you take care of your baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that kind of husband. Everybody should have a husband. I would have a husband if they weren't so awful to look at. In fact, we should all have a wife and a dog, too, in this basic uh, need. Now, if you get bored with your husband, you might want to try the wedge. Now, this is an ergonomic pillow designed to elevate the pelvis during lovemaking. Now, whether that's effective or not, I certainly don't know. But one thing I do know is it does pose decorating challenge. <laughs> you do it that way. As a graphic designer, I'm very obsessed with signage, and I always go to a new place and look at the signs. We were pretty impressed, gave pretty much an, an A to Google signage today. We were able to find our way from the parking lot to building 43. It's not always that easy. If this was our mother, this is what the signs would look like. Right? Complaints, incoming, outgoing, the unhappy hour, yes, alcohol is a downer. Um, but signage is not always as well designed as this, um, and we often find that you go into an otherwise amazing building with all new furniture and lighting and architecture, and you see that someone in security has, has taped homemade signs to the security desk saying, like, don't even ask me where the elevator is or other angry comments. Uh, there's a lot of do-it-yourself signage out there that usually expresses rage. And the rage is against us, the designers and the architects and the managers for failing to predict how the building would actually be used. Now, I occasionally take it upon myself to do my own guerrilla signage. 
This is some homemade signage in a little shopping mall near where I live. It was put up by a lady in the ladies' room who was very angry at how people were treating this space. Apparently they were peeing on the floor or something. Um, there's a lot of anger here. You know, I, I look at this um, and I'm like, okay, people, calm down. Turn off the caps lock. It's okay, right? And so here she, she's so proud of her bathroom that she has to destroy it with this really ugly sign. We see a lot of terrible things here, like visible tape, inexplicable <laughs> pagination, like really couldn't we get it to fit on one page, maybe? Okay. So I decided to take uh, matters into my own hands, and I, my daughter was off school last week, so we thought we'd do some gorilla signage. So, so that's Ruby, she's got her gorilla signage kit hidden away inside her bag. And we, went, we went to the mall with our own sign, and there she is, installing the sign in the bathroom. Um, and here's how it reads. And what we want to do is really uh, keep a sense of that anger, right? Because anger is important. But to make the typography look good, and it's, it's framed in a, a $2 IKEA frame, which makes it look very professional. And we will be watching the sign over the coming months and years and see if anybody takes it down. And my bet is nobody will take it down because it has the voice of authority to it, right? Anybody that walks into that bathroom, even the owner of the shopping mall, will think that somebody more important than them put up this sign. I right? don't get that with all caps, Ariel, I promise you. Anyone have porch envy? This is our house. It's what they call a snout house. A snout house is a house that is all garage on the facade. It's designed for easy access and the highest possible privacy. I was happy in my snout house. It was the first house I had ever signed a mortgage on back in 1989 when it was built. I was happy in my house until I went to the cul-de-sac just a couple hundred yards away that had been recently built. And they had something I didn't, which was a porch. And we saw a recurrence of porches under the influence of the new urbanism right around this time, around the you know, early 2000s. Now as an English professor, I have neither the skills nor the income to build myself a porch. But I do have something the ability to do research. And so I went on a self-directed research therapy to find out where the American porch came from, what had killed it, and whether these neo-porches were in fact doing the job that they were designed to do. So a few things I discovered. First of all, that the American vernacular porch, which became characteristic of domestic architecture from after the Civil War up until the uh, 1920s, 30s, and early 40s, has many sources, like the US Constitution and pineapple pizza, many different ingredients go into it. It begins in the ancient world with the Greek stoa and the Roman portico, where it was basically a feature of public buildings. Uh, Palladio, the Italian architect, created was probably the first Western domestic porch but certainly not a vernacular porch, not a porch for middle class uh, dwellers. Uh, the American porch uh, has some additional features in addition to those classical ones. Uh, from Africa, uh, the uh, enclosed, semi-enclosed thatched uh, openings of huts that would be around in a circular common area uh, came to the Americas through the slave trade. And also from India, the veranda, or the veranda, which is a long and deep porch, creates not only uh, an extra room, an outdoor room, but it's also a form of air conditioning. As the air goes through the veranda and into the interior of the bungalow, the air is cooled and made more habitable in the interior of the house. And this is also a feature, especially in the southern United States, of the function of porches. A classic American porch has all of these features. Notice, for example, the 
vestigial classicism, uh, as well as the size of the porch. And notice as well the flag hanging outside. Uh, porches were part of the public life of the sidewalk, and they were a place for people to, uh, to publicize their, their politics and their patriotism. So what killed the American porch? Uh, the automobile. Television, which drew people off of the porch and into the interior of the house. Air conditioning, which made the cooling function of the porch obsolescent. And of course, the rise of the backyard, which was part of the high security, high privacy orientation of post-World War II domestic architecture. So the Neo Porch is trying to bring back some of these features of the of American uh, porch and sidewalk life. Uh, knowing the origins of the porch did not yet cure my porch envy. And so I decided I had to return to that cul-de-sac with my digital camera and find out whether these neo-porches were indeed succeeding in their tasks. The answer was no. Look at the size of it. It's much too narrow and shallow uh, to be an outdoor room. It is basically a glorified entryway. This porch is a bit larger, but it's simply become another garage, right? It's uh, uh, for tricycles and strollers and the occasional red bucket. Uh, this porch is serving as a mailbox. Uh, a neighbor of mine, who actually lives in this house, is a very attractive scientist from Argentina. My age, you know, hasn't let herself go. And I asked her about her porch and said, do you use it? She says, well, I would never sit on it, but it's very convenient. And then she lowered her voice and she said, for special deliveries, like from Victoria's Secret and Frederick's of Hollywood. So the neo porch is assisting the sex lives of working mothers, but it's not necessarily reviving the lost sidewalk culture of yours. And then here's the porch as towel rack. No American flag, no we love Obama sign. Just towels from the pool. And so I checked out the newest houses in my development to see if the porch was making one last stand. And in fact, there were no porches in sight at all. Instead, just a turret to return to homeland security. <laughs> OK, this is our last little bit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about underwear. Um, this is really for the ladies. Guys, I, I apologize, but everything I'm about to tell you is true. Okay. Um, where I work at, at Cooper Hewitt in New York City on the Upper East Side, it's a very fancy lingerie store. And for many years, they had a sign hanging in the window announcing in very grave terms that 80% of American women are wearing the wrong size bra. And this, of course, has grave consequences. It, it creates a less youthful profile, a hanging effect, um, a lowering of the credit rating, and, and many other things. And so one day, I, I finally decided to go and I actually had to make an appointment to be properly fitted for a bra. And I learned a lot of things. And I learned that I was part of the 80%, which came as no huge surprise. And here's the basic, the short story of it. Here's the mistake that 80% of American women are making. What we're doing is we're wearing a, uh, the band is too big, and the cup, this part, is too small. And that's the mistake. It's the universal mistake. And what happens here is that the band is actually the architecture of the bra. That's what supports the, uh, the breasts. And when the band is too wide, it rides up in the back, and then the part in the front rides down, which is what it's basically designed to do. But we're trying to counteract that with underwear design. Um, and the cup, really the function of the cup, is to create shape. And that shape has changed from decade to decade and year to year. We've had different fashions. We've had, um, you know, torpedo rockets and ice cream cones and hamburger buns and all different shapes. <laughs> I'm rather a purist. I'd like to go back to basics and sort of perfect Bauhaus uh, geometry. Uh, many of us would like the bra to simply go away and to only have the, the 
uplifting effect and kind of hide all the architecture underneath. Um, for me, it all comes back to typography at the end of the day. Um, even if you get a bra that fits, which finally I, I did, I'm really pleased with it. It doesn't really fit because they don't really match. You see, there's no true symmetry to the human body, just as there is no true symmetry in typography, right? They both hang a little different, they're mounted differently, they point in slightly different directions. So unless you have a handmade bra, it's never going to be perfect. But most of us can do a little better, perhaps. Um, our grandmother was part of the generation who always wore a girdle, right? A girdle was a, this very heavily engineered structure that would, would you know, make you look a little bit slimmer and, and firmer and so forth. And she would never leave the house without a girdle or receive guests without a girdle. And usually she was wearing some other clothes as well. <laughs> and I thought this was a very, very scary piece of underwear. Um, our, our mother was a you know free love 70s hippie, and she certainly never wore a girdle. And when we grew up, we certainly never thought that uh, either. Little did we know the kind of technologies that would be available to young women today. And there are many women, especially in New York City, who would not leave the house without their power panties. Now, power panties are these kind of super lycra undergarments that compress the flesh and hold it stable, just like a girdle did in my grandmother's years. But they do it with this seamless tube of shiny black lycra. Um, a torture device, definitely, which perhaps it gives some women confidence that they were lacking. Um, now the thing about power panties is that at that point where the thing meets your actual body, there is a bit of a rebellion. And so they make power panties in all different lengths, depending on how much of your body <laughs> you want to uh, submit to this compressive force. And really, at the end of the day, there's only one solution to cover the whole thing. Okay? Um, so that's it. That's, that's us. That's our book. That's a taste of, of what we cover. That's the whole enchilada. And thank you very much. questions, we're going to give out copies of Design Your Life so they can be anything that interests you or maybe just something you want to share about your own underwear experiences or your porch or your baby carrots or whatever. I see someone bravely here. So maybe one, two, and three. Okay. Yeah. So, so it seems that there's one unspoken assumption here. Let's go all the way back. Just to one. <laughs> to to the, uh, the, the toilet paper example. Which is um, you've been talking about design, but you know, design is is attached to form and function. And so with the toilet paper roll, you know, you have to first figure out what is your objective. You know, if your objective is you know, with the square rolls to, to minimize the number of rolls, then you know, you can have I, I don't know. You you have to get individual tiny strands out and weave them together. Maybe do your own paper pulp process. <laughs> but but is you know, you have to figure. Out, in, in nowhere have you actually discussed what is the um, uh, um, that, that first, the first half. What is the objective of the design? How do you figure out what the objective is so you can design towards it? Right. So we could ask, what is the point of having a toilet paper roll dispenser at all? Right. Is that what you mean? Um, no. Or just you know, um, what, what is what is the idea? What the, the function of the ideal toilet paper dispenser? Yeah. Well, well, do you want to make it easy to change? Do you want to make right. it easy to use? Do you want to make it? Well, I think it depends on the context. So, like in the college dorm facility, sure. it's to prevent people from stealing toilet paper. Um, in many public spaces, you'll see giant toilet paper rolls, sure. and there the desire is to have lower maintenance and not having to change it so often. Shigeru Ruban in his experimental design wants to discourage overuse of toilet paper. I think the everyday housewife, like our, ourselves, we just want to get the roll off the goddamn floor where it's going to get wet. And we, we have a basket, so yeah. our kids just can reach that. Right, well, that, that's another way to get it off the floor, right? And to um, better that than. Sure, yeah. sure. So I guess, yeah, just the, um, the point, right, rather than the question was. Don't you have to say rather than design, you have to say design for what purpose? 
All right, we could look at anything like pillows that way as well. Is the goal to elevate the head during sleeping, or is it to express oneself through um, through style? I think ultimately one is doing both. Yeah. But, but I think there's elements of security too, like that having your toilet paper trapped and spring loaded thing gives people a sense of security that maybe having it in a basket feels too informal. Okay, they have an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. So I got the impression that a lot of these uh you showed are sort of uh, you know high property value in the metro area, creations of oak ink, perhaps rural porches from early American history. Um, do you think that a lot of their kind of uh, uselessness just derives from how small they have to be? Uh, if so, or did you run across any examples? Where you thought they were using limited space well, or should people just kind of give up the porch idea if they don't have enough, you know, some certain amount of space? Yeah, I really thought about that a lot, and my feeling is that yeah, that the, that the neo porch is attempting to restore something that has been so eroded by many developments, now including the internet. Right, people are inside not just because of TV, but because of other forms of activity that are creative and in themselves valuable. Now, wireless allows you to do the internet on your porch. Uh, but I think that uh, one of the reasons why we didn't see porches in that latest housing development in my neighborhood is because the porches in the earlier one didn't really succeed in solving the problems that they were setting out to do. And so it's not clear that the porch is the right solution. So that would be my answer there. And in terms of the toilet paper question, I, right before the talk, I did uh, have a chance to use the restroom here in building 43. Yeah, I was going to ask you And that I see that you have the goal of a paperless bathroom uh, with the, the, the options of the, the various. <laughs> <laughs>
he's obsessed with bringing the cans back next to the garage. Like, I don't care about that. I'll leave it till 7 o'clock at night. But the minute he sees that can out there, so like, that's what he cares about. So I think some of this is like, you have to decide, but what is the value? And if you really care about it, I believe you'll ultimately educate your family to care about it by seeing how much cooler it is and how the system and how beautiful things need and orderly. But you just can't make people change. That's so sad. Work with this. Yeah. Or, yeah, work with it and enjoy, enjoy the fact that you care about it. I mean, that's how I come to peace and have less, less nagging and less personal disappointment. Did you want to add to that? The question is, is whether it's your system or whether it's your family's system. Yeah, if it's your family's system, then everyone's going to have bought into it. Okay, maybe get them part of the process. Got it. Um, second question is, I'm about to embark on a project to build a house. And if you had any references or ideas or places I should hook up with, I can follow up with you after two. Yeah, I mean, just well, like, <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the best house building kind of resource, in my opinion. Thanks. Have fun with that. So we ran out of books, and we're probably almost out of time. But maybe if there's one more question, anybody else? you want to ask another question or just say goodbye? Okay, thank you very much. It was a lot of fun to be here.